Bible study. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome to this very special program to our local audience here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you for joining us. And those joining us across the country and around the world, watching on the various television networks and also on the internet, thank you for tuning in. Now, over the next few nights, we're going to be looking at some of the most important, some of the most fascinating prophecies in the Bible. So we're glad you're here. Now, you probably have some questions about this seminar. How long is it? What are some of the topics that we're going to be covering? Who's hosting the seminar? And some of those kind of questions. And so right at the beginning, we want to deal with those questions. First of all, you might be wondering, well, who are you? Well, my name is Jean Ross, and it is my privilege to be the host for this Bible study adventure. I would also like to introduce our speaker for this series. It's Pastor Doug Batchelor. Pastor Batchelor is the president of Amazing Facts. And he has a ministry, it's a media ministry, and so sometimes you can catch him on various television networks across the country and also in various places, even around the globe. I know in the Philippines, the programs are being broadcast there. He's on ABC Family, Lifetime, 3ABN, Amazing Facts TV, and many other networks. He also has a radio program once a week. It is a call-in Bible question program called Bible Answers Live. He's also an international speaker going to various Bible seminars around the globe. He just got back a little while ago from Australia. Early in the year, he was in China. He's also, if that's not enough, the senior pastor of a church in Sacramento, California. So we're just delighted that he's here with us in Albuquerque, and he'll be leading us in our study of Bible prophecy. Oh, by the way, he's also a pretty good racquetball player. I have that firsthand. I play racquetball with him now and again. So Pastor Doug, come join us. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Good evening, friends. Wow, we're so glad to see you all here. We're getting ready to have just a real exciting time uh, studying the most important subjects. Well, Pastor Doug, we've got some questions about the seminar. Now, by the way, we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask some Bible questions. You'll be able to uh, send us an email with your Bible questions. We're going to try and answer Bible questions. But we have some general questions here on this first program, common questions that people usually have. So Pastor Doug, we're going to address some of these right now. Uh, Amazing Facts is hosting this seminar. But what is Amazing Facts? You know, every now and then I meet people and, and I explain that I work with Amazing Facts or I've got my Amazing Facts baseball cap on. They say, what is Amazing Facts? It's really a great name for a Christian ministry. Started about 50 years ago. This coming year is going to be our 50th year. And with the idea that we would capture people's attention for spiritual devotional programs on radio, whether historical or scientific or fact from nature, and then bring in the spiritual lessons from the Bible. And the program just did very well. And after a years on radio, it then went on television and went into mission work and mission training, publishing, and God is just blessed. I've been with the ministry now for 20 years. And so uh, that's what we do. We do uh, gospel evangelism, mission work, mission training around the world. All right, Pastor Doug, we have another question here. Tell us about Pastor Doug. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I told the folks what you do, but tell us about yourself. <laughs> That's always an awkward question. It's kind of like the two people in Hollywood were talking at a cocktail party one night and the lady was talking and talking about herself and then she said, Oh, I'm sorry, I've been doing nothing but talking about myself. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? And so, <laughs> so uh, uh, one wife, five children, six grandchildren. I uh, haven't always been a Christian. I hope I can relate to just about everybody here because my mother was Jewish, my father came from a Baptist background, and I went to Catholic school. So uh, just uh, love people everywhere and uh, been living, born in California, grew up in New York City. Matter of fact, real quick, I'll just say this in, in another presentation, we'll give you, a, I'll share my testimony, but um, I was an atheist most of my life. And when I was 17, I moved up in the mountains, lived in a cave for a year and a half. Someone had left a Bible in the cave. And as they say, the rest is history. So, but I'll tell you more about that another time. All right, Pastor Doug, what can we expect from the Landmarks of Prophecy Seminar? Oh, 
I am absolutely serious. If you attend this entire seminar, you will never be the same. Mm -hmm. It will change your life. Some of you maybe saw the seminar we did out of New York City in 1999. Did anyone here see some of those programs? Yeah, I see several hands. We've had so many reports of lives that are changed. And it's not because, you know, we're wonderful speakers. It's because Jesus promises in Revelation chapter 1 a special blessing on those who read, hear, and keep the words of the prophecy. And so there's really blessings. I've seen marriages that are healed and families that are restored and, and just all kinds of wonderful things happen when you just make the Word of God the center of your focus. And even after tonight's presentation, you'll understand why this is so important. So I don't want to start preaching right now, though. How long are the meetings? Well, we have our opening weekend. You saw advertised. And, but the, there are actually 21 presentations that we're going to be right here for the entire series. And, uh, and that's not enough time to cover everything. Matter of fact, uh, I don't know if, if um, Pastor Ross had a chance to say anything, but for those of you who came and those who are watching on TV, you'll find this information at the Landmarks of Prophecy website. When you came in, you got lesson number one, which is what we're presenting tonight. When you're done, you'll end up with 24 of these presentations. You get three bonus ones. And you will be able to go from this seminar and study with your friends and family and you just see what the transformational power of the Word of God is. So it's a full series of gospel presentations with a prophetic uh, foundation. Well, that leads into our next question. What are some of the topics that we'll be studying over these next few meetings together? all of the hot topics. We're going to be talking about the second coming of Jesus and the rapture. We're going to be talking about Armageddon. We'll be talking about the tribulation. We'll be talking about the beast, 666, angels. I said Armageddon. Tribulation, what, what did I leave out? We're going to be talking about Jesus. We're going to be talking about the plan of salvation because all the prophecies in the Bible are really designed to be redemptive. And so that'll be the core of everything. But it's going to be, uh, we're not going to hold any punches, as they say. We're going to present exactly what you find in the prophecies, talking about what's happening in the world today, and trying to make it all relevant. All right, well, we've got one more question that folks might be having, and that is, what about registration? How does that work for the seminar? Probably some of the folks watching are asking the same question. Yeah, well, of course, if you go to the website and you register, uh, I think there's a special gift we'll send everyone who registers, but it just makes it easier for you. For instance, if you miss a presentation, which we hope you don't, but if you miss a presentation, you'll find out how to maybe uh, track down the archive of that or um, get the additional study materials. It'll just plug you into all the information and uh, help you get the most out of this program. But it really will change your life, I promise. Well, let me say a little more about the registration. Those of you who are here in our audience, if you look in the packet that you received when you came in, there is a little folder near the back. And pull out the card. It looks just like this. This is your registration card. We have some row hosts. If you don't have one of these registration cards for some reason, uh, one of the row hosts should have some extra ones. Just pull it out right now. This would be a good time to do it. And if you wouldn't mind, you can just fill in your registration card right now. And uh, we'll send along some buckets, and you can just drop your registration card in. Now, here's the deal that you want to keep in mind. Over here on this side of the registration card, you'll notice the barcode. You want to tear that off. You want to keep your barcode. Now, we're going to be talking about the mark of the beast later on. Pastor Doug, has that got anything to do with the barcode? <laughs> no. If it does, you've probably all got the mark at this point because you shop. <laughs> but here's the idea. You want to keep the barcode. Maybe put it on your keychain. Bring it with you every evening. And when you come in, you'll just scan the barcode and voila, you register. Now, after you come for a certain number of meetings, we've got some additional material that we would like to give you, some additional books. Actually, there is a book in particular that Pastor Doug has written that we'd like to give you. So please be sure to fill in your registration card, and we'll have some buckets that will be passed around. Just drop it in the bucket. For those of you who are watching online, you need to also register. Just go to the Landmarks of Prophecy website. Just Landmarks of Prophecy. There is a link that you can click and you can register online as well. There is some additional material that you'll be able to download. 
In addition to the material that we'll be giving you when you register, every night we'll be giving you the lesson that goes along with that presentation. So tonight you got your first lesson when you came in. Tomorrow evening you'll get the lesson that goes along with tomorrow night's presentation. So please be sure to fill in the registration card. And in a little bit the buckets will go around and you can just drop that in. If you need a registration card, just let the usher know and we'll be sure to get that to you at that point in time. You know, right now, while they're doing that, how many of you were here for the pre-program and you enjoyed listening to Kelly Maurer play and uh, John Lomacain? We are just so privileged to have these two recording artists here with us for this presentation. And uh, I think that uh, John has something special prepared for us right now. Thank you, John. You know, it's so dry in New Mexico, we need rain. What do you say? So tonight we're going to sing Showers of Blessing to bring God's heart close to us tonight. We're going to ask the Lord to water our souls, water our minds. So I'll, I'll ask you to join in on the second chorus, but here we go. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing Oh, that today they might fall Now as to God we're confessing Now as on Jesus we call Join me, are you ready? Showers of blessing Showers of blessing Drops around this are falling, but for the shower. But one more time on the chorus, are you ready? Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we Amen. 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 Thank you so much, John. We sure appreciate that. Beautiful. And Kelly, that was wonderful. All right, well, Pastor Doug, we're going to take some time for some Bible questions. But before we do that, whenever you study the Bible, you need to have the Holy Spirit guide you. After all, the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we want to just ask God's Amen. blessing to be upon the program. You know what? I'm going to ask if you can stand. And let's just begin with a word of prayer. Can we do that? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to open up your word. We recognize that the Bible is your book, and so we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and guide our hearts and our minds. Be with us here in Albuquerque, and be with those who are watching, wherever they might be. And Father, lead us into a deeper and a fuller understanding of what the Bible teaches. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, for each of our programs, we hope to take a few moments to take some Bible questions. And believe it or not, folks have anticipated this series, and so they've actually sent in some Bible questions. I believe tonight, Pastor Doug, we have four Bible questions that have come in, so we're going to take a look at them right now. I think we're going to try and put them up on the screen. All right, well, we have the first question right there. There it is. And our first Bible question tonight is, uh, why is it important for us to study Bible prophecy? Well, Bible prophecy actually has a transformational power to it. You can look, for instance, in the book of First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 19. And here he says, We have also the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed to, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so God through His Spirit has given us prophecies 
for one thing, to help us know that uh, the world is not just spinning wildly by accident without a purpose. God knows exactly what's happening from day to day. He has a plan for everybody's life, but prophecy fits in showing that uh, there's a design for each of us. So it's very important. All right. Well, let's take a look at our next question. And this is one that we get quite a bit. The question is, is God eternal or does he have a starting point? You know, there's some tough questions and kids always ask that. They say, um, if God made everything, who made God? There is a mystery in the universe. And it doesn't matter whether you're an atheist and uh, you think that everything happened as a result of a Big Bang or if you believe in God, everybody's got a challenge. In order for there to be a Big Bang, there had to be something because nothing does not come or something does not come from nothing. And so where did the something come from that somehow instigated the Big Bang? Or if God made everything, we can't comprehend where did God come from? It's a mystery. But the Bible tells us from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. And so God has always existed. You know, the concept of eternity just boggles our minds. And that's something we ought to really be excited about. We know in this life our time is very short. But if God is offering us eternity, and we know it's eternity in the future, then we shouldn't doubt that God existed in eternity in the past. So it is something of a mystery, but God has always existed. All right, well, thank you. Here's an interesting question. Jesus never instructed his apostles to write 27 books and then call it the New Testament. So how did the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, come to be? Well, of course, the Old and the New Testament uh, originate separately. The Old Testament scriptures, beginning with Moses, probably the first book that Moses wrote was the book of Job. Job would be the most ancient book in the Bible, but it's lumped together with the books of poetry and wisdom uh, in the middle of the Bible. And then Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and then from there there were inspired men that wrote all through the Old Testament. There was a 400 year period, now the Old Testament is written in Hebrew with some Aramaic. And this is like a 400 year period of silence. One of the last things it says in the Old Testament is that the Messiah is coming. Malachi chapter 4 talks about this messenger that would come to prepare the way of the Lord. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Then John the Baptist appears, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now the New Testament is written principally in Greek. And so then you have uh, the New Testament writers that wrote the inspired um, words and teachings of Jesus. And the word being written was very important to Christ. And 10% of everything Jesus said, he's actually quoting the Old Testament. And whenever Jesus was tempted by the devil, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. So Christ had the highest regard for the scriptures. All right. And then our final question for tonight, how do I know that the Bible can be trusted? Uh, some say that it's just a collection of old stories passed down from one generation to another. Well, how do we know you can trust the Bible? As I mentioned, I was an atheist, and when I started reading the Bible, I expected it was just a collection of fables and fairy tales. But what really convinced me were the prophecies. Because you think about the phenomenal power a person would have to have to know what's going to happen uh, even 10 minutes from now. Can you imagine how much uh, sports enthusiasts would love to have a prophet that could tell them who's going to win the World Series? How much the people on Wall Street would love to have a prophet that knew which stocks were going up and which were going down. Or to have a prophet that told you what freeways to avoid. <laughs> well, they got helicopters in the sky that help us with that. And God has a perspective from where he is that he sees all of eternity perfectly. Uh, just to give you a, a sample. Jesus said in about 30 AD, speaking of the temple in Jerusalem, said, I am telling you that there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down before this generation passes away. Biblical generation is 40 years. 40 years later, the Romans attacked Jerusalem. They demolished the temple. They did not leave one stone upon another. We know that Jesus said that before it happened. And yet it was perfectly fulfilled. And so when you see there are hundreds of prophecies in the Bible where God perfectly tells the future, 
you begin to realize there's a reason this is still the best selling book in the world it's because it never fails the heavens and earth will pass away Jesus said my words will not pass away the grass withers the flower fades but Isaiah said the word of God abides forever and so there's something eternal about this book that we should pay careful attention to we'll talk more about that Amen. now of course if you have a Bible question the place to go is landmarks of prophecy just go to the website you can type your Bible question right there and then we'll be able to get your question and we'll try and fit it into one of the upcoming programs now you might not get your question worded exactly the way that you type it in we try to categorize the questions topically and try to cover as many of those topics as possible so take a look at the website landmarks of prophecy and you can uh, post your question there and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible well Pastor Doug we have John Loma King he's gonna sing one more song and then we're gonna get to Absolutely. our study uh, we're thrilled to have John with us. Uh, I should mention that uh, John and I have been working together in doing evangelism 25, 25 years. <laughs> and so it's a joy to have him here and Kelly as well. Many years we've been working together and I trust that they're going to bless us. Thank you. Thank you, John. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Thank you so much, John. That's beautiful. I never get tired of hearing uh, Kelly play and John sing. Thank you so much. Well, friends, I want to welcome you to the Landmarks of Prophecy. Uh, this is, uh, we believe, going to be um, an epic Bible study spectacular because we're going to take just the high points of Bible, the landmarks of Bible prophecy study, and we're going to break them down together. I've been doing this now for 30 years and I never tire of how miraculous the Word of God is and sharing it with people because I see that it changes people's lives. Now as we go through our presentation tonight it's going to be based on a lesson that you have in your hands and I think when you came in you not only received a lesson you also received a pen and we're giving you the first one in advance hopefully you can see well enough where you are we're going to actually give you the answers and uh, so the answers will be on the screen you just fill them in and this makes it easier for you to be able to do that as you study the Bible later and then what you know I always forget about that whenever I mention that and people open their binders it sounds like popcorns cooking all of a sudden 
in the auditorium. All right, I'm going to give you a quiz. Do you recognize any of those places? Again, we've got to get them up on the screen for you to recognize them. We're talking about some of the famous landmarks of the world. One on the left there, what's that? Where's the Eiffel Tower? Paris, France. And the one on the right? Started in France, now in New York City, right? Those are landmarks that are recognized around the world. And then uh, how about uh, the next two? Do you recognize um, the white building? Well, you don't see it yet. <laughs> there it is. We got the Taj Mahal. And where's that? In India. And then next to it, you've got the Great Pyramids in, in Egypt. These are some landmarks that you have around the world. And uh, they help us identify places, uh, locations, uh, times in history when they were created. There are a number of landmarks in the Bible that also give us high points so that where we can know where we are in the biblical continuum of history. And that's what our lesson is based on tonight. There was a dream that was given to an ancient king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And the lesson is titled, The Dream of the Ages. Now, there's several times in history when God gives leaders and monarchs dreams to help them understand what's happening so that they can share and disseminate that information with their people. So that people will not think that life is just a series of meaningless accidents. How hopeless life would be if there was no purpose to life. If all that life is is we're just all biological accidents and there is no God, then life really has no meaning. God gives life meaning and the the knowledge that he is con in control that things aren't just spinning wildly um, out of control helps us know that there's a purpose to life now the name of this ministry is amazing facts and so I like to sprinkle a few interesting facts through the presentations one I was reminded of just a couple of weeks ago was regarding President Abraham Lincoln uh, some of you may or may not know that Lincoln had a very close law partner and friend named Lamont and Wade Lamont and he related that after the president was assassinated he said there was a small meeting that the president had with a few friends and family including his wife Mary Todd uh, a few days before the assassination he said I had the strangest dream last night he said I went into the White House and there was a uh, an assembly of soldiers all gathered around a body that was draped and I asked one of the soldiers what is this and they said it's the president he was killed by an assassin and so here he had this premonition now it, it made his wife very nervous when she heard that and he said I'm sure it wasn't me he told his wife he said you know dreams don't really mean anything but it makes you wonder well there are other times in history that God has given dreams to monarchs Perhaps you remember the story where the Pharaoh of Egypt had a dream to help them prepare for what was coming to that country and Joseph helped prepare because he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. This king of Egypt was given a dream. Another little amazing fact. Sir Isaac Newton, one of the uh, great scientists of history. I mean he's really the, the father of calculus and his book on mathematics became sort of the, the textbook for many years of uh, mechanical philosophy. He built the first reflecting telescope. Uh, you know, all we think about him is sitting under a tree and an apple falling on his head, but that, that really simplifies the genius of Newton. He was also an astronomer, mathematician, physicist, a brilliant man, but what many people don't know is he was also an avid student of Bible prophecy and he firmly believed in the dependability of Bible prophecies. He was fascinated with numbers and uh, just a, like I said a genius of a mathematician and he realized that the numbers in the Bible could not line up so perfectly unless there was a greater mind behind them. Now, this is the father of calculus who recognized that when he read the Bible. But he's not alone. Other scientists like Michael Faraday and many others and even Christopher Columbus were fascinated with the books of prophecy. The favorite book for Isaac Newton was the book of Daniel. 
because there are many time prophecies in the book of Daniel. We'll get to some of the time prophecies another night. But tonight we're going to talk about a prophecy that's in Daniel chapter 2. And most of this presentation is going to deal with this dream of the ages that this ancient king had. Nebuchadnezzar, his name is pronounced a few different ways, spelled two different ways in the Bible, was the king of Babylon. This empire was really at the zenith of power for the ancient empires. And he had a very broad, extensive empire. One of the first kingdoms you find in the Bible was built by Nimrod when he left the tower of Babel and he formed the kingdom of Babel. And uh, later, the tower of course was destroyed, but Nebuchadnezzar, he rebuilt everything. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the scope and the size and the glory of that kingdom. But if you read in Daniel chapter 2, it tells us that the king went to sleep one night and he was troubled about the future. He had conquered all these other kingdoms around him. He'd conquered Egypt and he'd conquered Jerusalem, carried off captive thousands of prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylon and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites and the kingdom of Tyre and many others. And he had become a king of kings. But he wondered how long will it last? Even though he ruled 45 years, halfway through his rule, he just, he said, you know, human life is temporary. And what's going to happen to this empire when I'm gone? Solomon pondered those same things. You build it all up and it's vanity of vanity. What happens when you're gone? So he went to bed troubled and worried about the future and God gave him a, a marvelous dream, a very vivid dream. Now we all have kind of strange dreams that you know are just meaningless. And if I used to play chess hour after hour and then you stare at that board with the black and white squares and I dream of checkers or chess boards because I saw it all day long. And I used to snow ski. I went to a school where we skied several times a week. And I'd dream and in my sleep I'd, I'd be skiing. Well that's not a supernatural dream. And as John mentioned, I, I like to play racquetball. And it's a fast game and you're just you're always swinging like this. And, and once or twice in the night I've gone like this and you know, and Karen said, what's the matter? I said, oh I'm sorry I was going for a shot. And I, I just <laughs> so even Ecclesiastes said a dream comes through the multitude of business. And not every dream means anything. But he had a dream that he was absolutely sure it was three-dimensional, it was vivid, it was divine, and he knew it had a meaning to it, but he didn't know what the meaning was. And you can read about this now, if you go with me in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles there with you, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, I'm going to read this. I know it's a little dim, and if you can't read, I'll be reading it for you. But um, this dream, and we'll begin with verse 31. This is what uh, he dreamed, and this is Daniel relating the dream. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. So here's this great, splendid, awesome image. Now, keep in mind, an image in the Bible, they were told not to worship images. They had plenty of idols and images in Babylon. So in the Jewish mind just recognize idolatry was forbidden. The image had a head of fine gold. Its chest and its arms were of um, silver. Its belly and its thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floor. These heavy metals suddenly became like chaff that became very light and the wind carried them away so that no trace of them, not just one little particle, no trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the image, it becomes a great mountain and it fills the whole earth. Now what does this dream mean? Now this is a, an overview of the dream. We're going to delve now into the lesson. We're going to back up a little bit and start with the beginning of chapter 2. And point by point we're going to go through and we're going to study this chapter together. Because this dream of the ages gives us a panorama of history from the time Nebuchadnezzar had the dream until the end of the world. And you see if you can figure out where we are in the scheme of time as we look at this together. So I'm with that as an introduction I'm going to get 
into the lesson. Oh, by the way, here he is. This is the, uh, um, a friend of mine who uh, led an evangelistic organization gave me this one time. And I thought, well, this is a, a great figure. I might, might refer to uh, Melvin here. Got to give him a name. <laughs> Hope nobody hears the name Melvin tonight. We're going to get into our study and uh, start with question number one in the lesson. I find one of the best ways to teach is the question-answer format. Question number one. Why did God give the Babylonian king this dream? We don't have to wonder. The answer is right in the Bible. Now you're going to see on the screen the answers are going to be up there and you're invited to say the answers out loud with me. And all of these references are found in Daniel chapter 2. That one's verse 28. And I will read it together. There is a God in heaven that reveals what? Secrets. And makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So it's talking about the future. Secrets of the future are being revealed in this dream, says the prophet Daniel. Okay? Well, when the king first had this dream, he didn't know what it meant. He instinctively called for all of his wise men and counselors, and they came along. And uh, he said, I've had a dream, and I don't know what the dream means. They were on the payroll full-time, supposed to be able, you know, they were astrologers and soothsayers and card readers and everything else. And, and he said, what does this dream mean? And they said, okay, king, tell us the dream. We'll tell you what the dream means. Well, you know, you ever have a dream and when you first get up, it's just real vivid and 20 minutes later you're having trouble, it gets fuzzy pretty quick because your dreams are really happening in a different part of your brain. And he said, you know, the details are already starting to get fuzzy. He said, you guys are supposed to be wise men that understand mysteries. How do I know you're just not manufacturing, you're going to make up some interpretation? Prove to me you've got supernatural ability to interpret my dream. You tell me what the dream is, and then I'll know you can tell me the interpretation. Well, that kind of flushed them out. And they said, oh, no, that's not how it works. You tell us the dream. We'll make up, I mean, we'll tell you an interpretation. <laughs> said, no. And he started getting mad because they were buying time and stalling. And he so much wanted to know the answer to what this meant that he uh, became a little irritated. And this is question number two. When the king's counselors failed to reveal and interpret the dream, what was Nebuchadnezzar's command? And the king commanded and he said, and here you find the answer in Daniel 2 verse 12, the king commanded to destroy all of the wise men of Babylon. Now at this point I've got to give you a little background. I told you that Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem a few years earlier. And among the people that he took into the kingdom, along with thousands of the Jews, he took some of the children of the royal line, princes. He trained them in the language of the Babylonians so that they could be sitting among the counselors and thus they could represent the thousands of Jews and others in the kingdom. He knew that the Jews were a very bright people. He had seen the Temple of Solomon. He actually destroyed it. He knew that they were very sophisticated and he said, I want to train some of these young men that are already bright and educated in our language. And they were part of the wise men, but they weren't invited. They weren't senior wise men. They weren't invited when the king said, tell me what my dream means. So when the decree went out that all the wise men are going to be executed on a certain day, finally, Daniel and his three friends, you probably have heard their names before, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they hear about this thing. And they were a little concerned. They thought, why is this happening? Number three, when Daniel learned about the decree, what did he ask of the king and what did he tell his friends? And here's your answer. It says, Daniel went in and he desired of the king that he would give him time and he would show the king the interpretation. Then it goes on to say, Daniel went to his house, the king granted them time, because the king he wanted to know what the dream, he thought, what well, if I kill all the wise men, I'm still not going to know what the dream means. Here's some young men that he had tested before. He found they were unusually bright. They seemed to have integrity. They were godly young men. They stood up for their religion when others compromised. He said, they said, give me a little time and we can tell the king. Well, you know, they didn't want to lose that opportunity. And so he thought, well, I'll find out. And so Daniel went to his house. He made the thing known to Hananiah, 
Mishael and Azariah his companions that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this there you got that word again secret so they went home and they had a prayer meeting what would you do if you knew you had to dream something that I dreamed tell me what it was are you gonna die well they had a real serious prayer meeting number four when the Lord revealed the dream to Daniel to whom did not Daniel give credit? During the night Daniel went to sleep and the Lord gave him this same exact dream. He just knew divinely that it was the dream the king had had. You know when the dream came to the Pharaoh of Egypt it was given twice. Now this dream is given twice too to Nebuchadnezzar. It's given once to Nebuchadnezzar and once to Daniel affirming that it's gonna happen. It's like when Jesus said truly truly verily verily it's gonna happen. You can count on it. When the Lord revealed the dream to Daniel to whom did Daniel give the praise and the credit? He said, yeah, he could have said, well, you know, I've got the supernatural ability and I need a raise. Hey, I need a promotion. He didn't say that. He said, I thank thee and I praise thee, O God of my fathers. And then he told Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. There's that word again. This is a secret that is being revealed about the future. All right, now let's get into the dream. And can you imagine when Daniel comes before the dream, he begins to tell the king what the king saw in his dream. You can imagine Nebuchadnezzar sat down on the edge of his throne and he listened with his mouth gaping. And he was just so fascinated by that. So what are the two objects that it says that they saw in the dream? All right. He, he says, Thou, O king, saw, and behold, there was a great a great image. Now earlier in Daniel it talks about an image like a lion and one like a leopard and one like a bear and it tells us when these images were like animals. This image it doesn't connect it with any kind of animal so most scholars agree it was probably an image resembling a man because it mentions toes, it mentions a chest, it mentions arms so that's why virtually all the artists you're gonna see they come up with something like this. They take some of the um, the looks that they find on the ancient Babylonian carvings and, and they make an image based on that. So there's actually some artistic and historical accuracy that goes into the depictions that you're seeing there. He describes to the king, he says, Thou, O king, saw us this great image. And then he said, the second thing was, beside the image, he said, Thou saw that a, a stone. So you've got two principal things that are at odds in this dream. One is a stone, one is a statue. One represents God's kingdom. The idol, the image, represents the kingdoms of man. Now, you know when the Jews made their altar, God told them, do not even lift up a chisel on it or you've polluted it. Take rough stones. Build my altar out of twelve rough stones. He was concerned about the people getting into idolatry. Ten Commandments which were the center of God's kingdom. In other words, when you get the holy mountain, you get the holy city, you get the holy temple, you get the holy place, you get the holy of holies, you get the holy ark in the holy of holies. And the only thing in the ark were stone tablets written by the finger of God. So in the Jewish mind, this stone that destroys the image, they knew it represented God's kingdom. So you see these two big opposing elements here in the dream. All right, question number six in your lesson. So let's start to decipher this now. Daniel tells him the dream. Now Daniel begins to tell him what does the dream mean. After Daniel tells the king about the dream and he says, here's the dream. Can you imagine the king going, yes, that's what I saw. Yes, 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 that was the dream. Oh, how did you know that? Now the king is really excited. So when Daniel begins to tell the king what the dream means, does the king doubt Daniel's accuracy? No. If I have a dream, vivid dream, and you can tell me exactly what I dreamed the next day and you say, now let me tell you the interpretation. I'm all ears. So you can imagine this monarch was very connected, tuned in. Number six, what does the head of gold in the dream represent? Daniel said to the king, thou art this head of gold. The head, the kingdom, is going to begin, this vision about the history of the world's empires is going to begin with this prominent world empire of Babylon and it's going to make its way all the way down to the end of time which I think you're going to find out is where we are and it starts with the head of gold. 
Now that probably made uh, King Nebuchadnezzar feel pretty good when Daniel said, you are the head of gold. And uh, a lot of folks, if they wanted to get on well with the king, would have stopped right there and said, don't tell him anything else. Just say, you're the head of gold. How do you feel? <laughs> you're at the top. Now why did he say that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold? Because this dream is outlining the history of the main world empires that would impact God's people that had scripture from the time of Daniel to the end. During the time of Daniel God's people had been conquered and were scattered. And as you go through time you're going to find that. The kingdoms that are being mentioned as we study tonight are not representing all the kingdoms of the world. You're not going to find any reference. Earlier this year I was in China. I've been there a few times. But we were able to do a full public evangelistic meeting in a city with six million people. It was wonderful because that was just history making. And it was televised. It was recorded for television. They had a big empire even back in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And you know from your history there were great empires among the Mayans. We've been with the ruins among the Mayans and down in South America among the Incas and some in far in uh, Southeast Asia. And there were different empires. The kingdoms that are mentioned in this dream are the ones that had direct impact in particular on the Jewish people for the first part of the dream and on the church for the last part of the dream. So you'll see as we go on what we're talking about. So it's outlining the history of the world. Babylon was called the head of gold because it really was a golden empire. I mean it's just fascinating. I've got a few facts here just that uh, come from the, the famous ancient historian Herodotus where he talks about uh, Babylon. Matter of fact some archaeologists say it's so phenomenal they can't even believe that it's all true. But um, the Greek historian from 450 BC Herodotus he said the outer walls of Babylon were 56 miles around. Can you imagine that? There's, there's room there in that plain. The, um, the walls were 300 feet high, 80 feet thick at the bottom, 25 feet thick at the top, and two four-horse chariots could pass each other on top of the wall. It was like an interstate. There were... Um, and this was of course uh, during the 45 year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. It was at the uh, top of its splendor. It was a square city with approximately 15-14 miles on each side. Brick walls surfaced with glazed blue and gold bricks. Um, behind the main wall was another wall 75 feet. The Euphrates River, don't miss this because this comes into Revelation later. The Euphrates River ran right under the walls, irrigated the entire city. They had more water in the Euphrates back then because now it's all getting sucked up by Turkey and other countries that are north. The Euphrates used to run a lot uh, more massively than it does now. And uh, a moat completely went around the city between the outer wall and the inner wall. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, that's the picture that you see on the screen. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar married the daughter of the king of the Medes and she was disappointed because the Median Empire in the north had mountains. But Babylon is in a big vast plain. And she felt homesick all the time. So he said, don't worry dear, I will build you a mountain and I will forest it. And so he made this great terraced gardens. They, they uh, Strabo and other ancient uh, historians said they had machines they had invented for taking the water and lifting it up and it would cascade down and irrigate these gardens and like waterfalls. And uh, they were manpowered somehow but they had somehow built some machines for pumping water even back then. So they had tons of gold everywhere. Great, they had a, a table of gold that weighed tons and gold statues and so it really was a golden kingdom. I don't even have time to, you ought to read about uh, some of the things that it tells us about uh, the size of ancient Babylon and some of the wonders that are there. But uh, this was a golden kingdom. Matter of fact, if you read in Daniel chapter 4, uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually He's so proud of the empire, he walks around on the balcony one day and says, is not this great Babylon that I have built for my majesty and my glory? It was a glorious kingdom. He was the head of gold. Now something interesting about what we're hearing right now, we're studying ancient Babylon. Well you know where that is? Our son was in the Marines a few years ago during 
won of the Gulf Wars and he was based in Iraq and uh, right now Iraq is in the news with ISIS when you read in the Bible about Jonah and Esther and Daniel and Ezra and Ezekiel and Nehemiah all of them are going in and out of the same territory that is in the headlines today the ISIS warriors, ISIL, ISIS, it depends on what element you're talking about they are fighting now to build, to restore a caliphate empire because they're inspired by what Nebuchadnezzar once had in that region of ancient Persia they would like to have their own empire because you know the Islamic countries are all divided and broken and uh, you look at a map it's the same territory some of you may or may not know that Saddam Hussein that was his great ambition that he could restore the ancient glory from the days of Nebuchadnezzar when they were a world empire now here's a picture where Saddam had a poster of himself and he said that he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar now the Nebuchadnezzar we're talking about tonight is technically they called him Nebuchadnezzar the second but no one knows about the first so they don't ever use that it's just he's the big one he's Nebuchadnezzar here's a, an example of a coin Saddam Hussein had a coin imprinted with him with the vision of Nebuchadnezzar in the background he wanted to why do you think he invaded Kuwait? Uh, he was trying to expand control the oil so that he could expand he wanted to be the leader of the Islamic worlds and restore that ancient glory again matter of fact um, there was a Jewish prophecy that says that Babylon would never be rebuilt Nebuchadnezzar wanted to overrule or confound that prophecy and he spent five, no not Nebuchadnezzar, sorry, Saddam Hussein and Saddam Hussein spent five hundred million dollars trying to restore ancient Babylon to thwart this Jewish prophecy that said it would never be rebuilt again and in the midst of his first attempt to rebuild it you can see even some of the workers there the desert storm came along and then it was brought to a halt, dried up his resources then he had just begun to try to rebuild it again when the second Iraq war broke out and ultimately he was arrested and came to a uh, unhappy ending now here's the prophecy that you find in the book of Isaiah that talks about what would happen to ancient Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar it says and Babylon this is Isaiah 13 verse 19 to 21 and Babylon the glory of the kingdoms the beauty of the Chaldeans pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah it will never be inhabited nor will it be settled from generation to generation nor will the Arabian pitch tents there nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there but wild beasts of the desert will lie there their houses will be full of owls ostriches will dwell there and wild goats will scamper or caper or dance there and you go there today and it's, there's nothing he was not able to re I mean the, there's some tourist spots but he wanted to make it the new capital God stopped that again so back to Daniel talking to Nebuchadnezzar what happens next in the dream? He should have just stopped when he said, you're the head of gold. But number seven, it said, would the Babylonian kingdom last forever? Well, no, he says, after thee, this is the rest of the, uh, the dream, after thee shall arise what? Another kingdom. You can write that in, inferior to thee. Now, if I can't have gold, I'm happy with silver, but let's all agree, the ounce of silver is not worth an ounce of gold. These things are decreasing in value as you go down through the metals, but they are increasing in hardness all the way down through the image. And so uh, just notice that, and I'll say more about that. Another prophecy that talked about what would happen to Babylon is found in Jeremiah that came true. Jeremiah the prophet said in 2512, I will punish the king of Babylon and it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar that was punished, well Nebuchadnezzar was punished too but ultimately it was his grandson that was overthrown I'll punish the king of Babylon and that nation saith the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans I'll make it a perpetual desolation and that's what you find in that region today and there's another picture of some of the ruins the Bible even tells when you get to chapter 5 of Daniel, you're getting kind of an overview of Daniel tonight in chapter 5 of Daniel it tells about how that happened Nebuchadnezzar, as I said, he reigned 45 years. He ultimately converted. If you read the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar ultimately, after a couple of back backsliding episodes, 
the end of his life he was praising the God of the Jews. He believed in him. And you might even meet him in heaven if we all get there. But uh, his grandson was different. His name was Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar's father, Nabadonis, was outside the kingdom trying to defend the kingdom from other nations that were making inroads. Belteshazzar was left in charge. He was sort of the second in command, but he was called the king at that point. And he had a, a feast. Now the reason he had this feast is because all surrounding the kingdom of Babylon, the Medes and the Persians had come to try to conquer the city. But their walls were so ma massive the young king wanted to show disdain. He said, said, I'm not afraid of the Medes and the Persians. They can't get in here. And so they had a big feast. They said they had enough food to withstand a siege of 20 years. You know in warfare um, it's very expensive to run a war. And when you besiege a city the longer they can hold out, you know if you can't conquer their capital you can't feed your army forever. Jerusalem uh, was besieged for two years by Nebuchadnezzar before it fell. Masada in Israel was besieged by the Romans for three years. They had food, they held it up. Matter of fact as the Romans were trying to take the city the Jews were throwing food and water over the walls in the desert to show that they had plenty, they weren't afraid. Three years they had to build a ramp to try and take it. Many armies have uh, failed just because economically they couldn't handle a long siege. And so the king said you're going to run out of money and resources before we do. We got the water coming under the walls, we got storage galore in the silos of the city and so they had a big feast. And the king began to drink during the feast. And then to show that his God was more powerful than all the other gods, the idols that he worshipped, he said, didn't we capture all those beautiful vessels of gold from the temple in Jerusalem? I want to drink out of those vessels. I'm going to toast my God using Jehovah's vessels. He was mocking the God of the Bible. So he called for his servants to bring from the treasuries the vessels that had been captured from Solomon's temple, the cups and the bowls, and he began to use them to pour wine in and to drink and to toast his gods, mocking the God of heaven. In the midst of their revelry, at the peak of their party, all of a sudden a bloodless hand appeared, just a hand, this big plaster blank spot like a billboard on the walls of ancient Babylon and began to write in these cryptic letters, burning letters in the wall and you can imagine that everybody froze and got scared. The Bible actually says the king was so frightened his knees smote together. You ever been so scared that your knees are knocking? First time I preached that's what I looked like. <laughs> I was so scared my hands were sweating. I mean they were terrified. And he called for the wise men again. And they were, you know, they, Pharaoh called for his wise men too. They never did seem very wise. And his wise men couldn't tell what it meant. But the queen, now this is many years after Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's still alive. He's now an old man. He's been in the kingdom for just about 70 years. He may have been in his 90s, but he's still strong and healthy. And the the queen, she says, there's a man that was in the empire, no mystery was too hard for him. Daniel is summoned to the party. He didn't go to that party. He knew better. So they bring him in. The king says, I'll make you third ruler in the kingdom if you tell me what that writing says. Daniel said, I know what the writing says and you can keep your gifts. And the reason the king said, I'll make you the third ruler, ruler in the kingdom is because the king was only the second ruler in the kingdom. So Daniel called in, old man, and he begins to tell him. The writing said, meeny, meeny, tickle you farson. The handwriting on the wall. You heard that expression before? Meaning, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tikal, thou art weighed in the balances. You're being judged and you are found wanting. You're coming up short. You're going to fail in the judgment, in other words. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians who are outside the wall. And at the very moment that Daniel was in the banquet hall interpreting what that dream meant, Cyrus the Persian general outside the wall had done something brilliant. Without the king of Babylon knowing, upstream, way upstream in the Euphrates River, there was a dry lake bed. They dug a great channel right next to the Euphrates River. At the right moment then they broke the dam separating it. All the water was diverted from the Euphrates River and began to run off into this dry lake bed the water level where it ran under the walls of Babylon dropped, it was at night, his army marched under the walls, 
the soldiers within the city, in the inner walls, they're not sure what happened. I mean, here's an, actually an artist's conception of that. Some of the soldiers were either drinking or through uh, treachery. Some, maybe they conspired with somebody on the inside. The gates were left open, the inner wall. And the army went in, they opened the other gates, the Medes and the Persians came pouring into the city. That very night, Belteshazzar was slain. Or Belshazzar the king, I'm sorry, was slain. Belteshazzar was the Babylonian name of Daniel. It's very close. Here's the prophecy. Now catch this. I'm going to read a prophecy to you that was written by Isaiah the prophet. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that Isaiah the prophet wrote these things before they happened. 150 years before they happened, listen to what Isaiah says in chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, names him 150 years before he's born. To his anointed, Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, I'm helping you, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. And when it says to loose the loins of kings, that means that the joints of the kings would be loose. And that's what happens when a king shakes. And this is exactly what happened. Cyrus the general, general, he went in, they conquered the uh, kingdom, and you can go to the British Museum and there is what they call the Cyrus Cylinder. I've actually seen this. And in that cylinder, in cuneiform, they've translated cuneiform, Cyrus talks about conquering Babylon, and I believe Jerusalem is even mentioned during that time because he later lets the Jews go back home again to their land. So now the kingdom, the head of gold, passes from Nebuchadnezzar onto the Medo-Persian kingdom. And so this happened approximately 539 BC and the Persian kingdom was of course another powerful kingdom lasted from 539 to about 331 BC. Their capital was Persepolis, and uh, their medium of exchange was silver. So it's entirely appropriate that they're represented here by the the silver arms. You've gone from Babylon to Medo-Persia and uh, they had a vast kingdom. But um, silver is not as valuable as gold. They lasted longer, but they didn't have the same glory that Babylon had. Got to keep moving. There's a lot to cover, and I hope you'll read Daniel chapter 2 when you get home and you can take time to read the whole chapter. Number 8. What metal would represent the kingdom that followed Medo-Persia? Answer? It says yeah, in um, Daniel, another third kingdom of brass. Actually we say brass. Brass has got some tin included in it. It's the ancient word for bronze. Would be, but you polish bronze, it looks the same way. Shall bear rule over all the earth. Now Daniel's saying this is going to even have a vaster territory than the Persian kingdom. What kingdom came next after the Persian kingdom? It was the kingdom of Greece. How many of you have heard of a young Macedonian ruler by the name of Alexander? better known as Alexander the Great. And he conquered the Persians and uh, in 331, very quickly in his battles with Darius, and he swept, in just 11 years, he swept through that country. Not only did he take the territory of Persia, he went off into the elements or the regions of India and up through Afghanistan. And so Alexander was phenomenal. But by the time he was 21 years old, he had conquered Egypt. It was just phenomenal what he did and how far he marched his armies. He's a brilliant general, trained by some of the great uh, Greek philosophers. And uh, what do you think their armor was made out of? They were called the bronze soldiers. And they had the bronze swords, and I'll bring that up later. And I think I even have a picture here of, of what some of the um, helmets looked like. They had bronze helmets. And uh, Alexander's kingdom lasted a little longer than the Persian kingdom. Each kingdom is lasting longer, but the metal is not worth quite as much. And so these were the bronze, bronze soldiers. In, there's one quote from a historian, um, Arian is I believe his name, the Historical Library, Book 17, uh, I think it's actually Book 16, Chapter 12, and this is what he says about the rule of Alexander the Great. I am persuaded that there was no nation or people then being whither his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over both his birth and his actions. It seemed like there was a divine hand that was protecting him as he went everywhere. But even though Alexander the Great could um, conquer much of the world, he could not conquer himself. 
and he actually died in Babylon and uh, just shy of 33 years of age matter of fact when he was on his deathbed they're not sure he died of a fever lasting several days they don't know if someone poisoned him others had wondered if it was malaria or it may have been a cause he had before the fever came on he had had a, a lot of drinking going on it might have been alcohol poisoning the historians aren't sure but he was semi-conscious drifting in and out and his wife asked him his son was very young and she said who will rule if you die he said the strongest and that's exactly what happened his kingdom was divided in four parts by his generals that end up warring among themselves but the kingdom of Greece uh, lasted for several hundred years and that was during the time of 331 to 168 BC now what do you think happens next here if you go to question number nine and uh, I think some of you could guess what comes on the scene next what metal represents the fourth kingdom now you got it and haven't even put it on the screen yet Daniel chapter 2 verse 40 the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron as much as iron subdues and breaks other things it was one of the strongest metals they had back then they didn't have the kind of reinforced steel or stainless steel that we have now but you could take a Roman sword that was made out of iron and you could actually break a Greek sword made out of bronze I mean you remember when David I assume that you've read some of these stories David when he killed Goliath he had to take Goliath's iron sword he didn't even have a sword and later when David went into battle he said I need a sword they had no swords in the kingdom but the Philistines knew how to forge iron it was a very valuable art back then David went into battle with Goliath's sword that must have been a doozy huh because it was iron it could break the swords of uh, many of the other enemies it was during the time of the iron monarchy of Rome that uh, Jesus was born it was those Roman soldiers that went with their iron swords into Bethlehem and killed the babies it was an iron spear that pierced Jesus side probably iron nails that pierced his hands and his feet Rome was his iron empire and just as the Persians lasted longer than the Babylonians and the Greeks lasted longer than the Persians the Romans lasted longer than the Greeks it tells what happens through history many of you know about your Roman history number 10 what would happen after the fall of the Roman Empire you can read in Daniel chapter 2 verses 42 sorry 41 and 42 it said the kingdom shall be divided as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken and as Rome expanded it tried to envelop such a big territory that gradually decadence began to set in and the kingdom began to implode I mean we've all heard about Nero fiddling why Rome burned and we've heard about the the games in the Colosseum and we've all heard about the orgies and and uh, under the time of Augustus Caesar they were more interested in morals and family but after he fell off the scene they had a couple of military Caesars and then they got some very um, immoral uh, governors of Rome and the morals of the country sank as that happened the other empires seeing the opportunity from the north the barbarians came in Hannibal came up from Carthage and and Rome was under well Hannibal came earlier but Rome was under constant attack and gradually the kingdom divided by the way you know I I just thought I really ought to share this tonight uh, if you read in history Edward Gibbons who wrote his book Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire when he talks about some of the five components that he thought contributed to the fall of Rome I thought some of them sounded similar to what's happening in the Western world today this was his analysis five prime reasons for Rome's downfall the undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home number two increasing taxes and spending of public money for bread and circuses number three now he wrote this a long time ago the mad craze for pleasure with sports becoming more exciting and more brutal number four the building of armaments when the real enemy was the decadence of the people number five the decay of religion with faith fading into mere form basic faith that makes a moral society 
that uh, gives you civilization and protection. Philip Myers in his book, Rome, Its Rise and Fall, he observed, almost from the beginning, the Roman stage was gross and immoral. It was one of the main agencies to which must be attributed the undermining of the, original, of the originally sound moral life of Roman society. So absorbed did the people become in the indecent representations of the stage that they lost all thought and care for the affairs of real life. It's hard for us to imagine that the Romans had become so absorbed in their media back then. They all lived for what was going to be on the stage from week to week. They had these theaters everywhere. That's all they talked about. They didn't think about the real issues of life. I mean, wow, if they had a problem then, what's going on now? I mean, they didn't have 150 channels. I thought, whew. Okay, getting back into our study. So, I think we all know that Rome started to gradually disintegrate and what was once a united, mighty, vast empire broke up into originally ten kingdoms. And those ten kingdoms, some of their ancient names, and I'll give you the modern equivalents, the Alamanni, which were the Germans. I know our friends that are listening to the Spanish translation right now. Aleman or Alamanni is, that's Germany. Um, then you have the Franks, which was the French, the Burgundians, which were the uh, Switzerland, the Suivi, which was Portugal, the Lombards, which is Italy, the Visigoths, which is Spain, the Anglo-Saxons, England, and then when they first divided they also had what we call the Vandals, that's where you get Vandalism because the Vandals went and broke all the, they defaced all the Roman statues, they called them Vandals. Uh, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. So the Roman Empire broke into ten distinct parts and it's broken up many times since then. Well that would put us down into the end of this image where you've got this, uh, now you're down to the feet of not just iron but iron and what? Clay. What was man made out of in the beginning? Clay. You know it's very interesting. One of the oldest concrete buildings in the world is in Rome. It's the Pantheon. You know what all modern concrete is built out of? You ever watch them pour concrete? It's miry clay and iron rebar. You know what the number one building material is in the world today? Concrete. Whew, you should go to China. They got so many problems with concrete dust everywhere. There's just a forest of building cranes. They call the building crane the national bird in China because they're everywhere. I mean, I've never seen construction like that. But we are living in that time of iron and miry clay, the age of concrete. Number 11. Would these ten kingdoms ever succeed in uniting? Answer. It says here, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, and here you got it, but they shall not cleave one to another. They'll not stick one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. They could not weld together, even though they tried. Matter of fact, they were so desperate at one point, Queen Victoria, she had, uh, she had the longest and most prosperous of the English reigns. She had 40 children and grandchildren and by the end of her reign she was related to every leader in Europe through marriage. They tried to reforge and rebuild that confederacy that Rome once had through marriages but it didn't last. Matter of fact you can just look at history. You got everybody from Louis the Fourteenth to Charlemagne to Napoleon to Kaiser Wilhelm to uh, Adolf Hitler. They were all trying to reforge the word Kaiser. You know what that means in uh, German? Caesar. The word Tsar. You know what that means in Russian? It means Caesar. They were all trying to regain the power of the Caesar once again. But the Bible said they will not cleave one to another. I understand Adolf Hitler had a Christian secretary and when she found out about his plans, she said, uh, sorry my Fuhrer, but this will not work. He said, what do you mean? She said, the Bible says it will not work in the book of Daniel. He said, well, we'll change the Bible. <laughs> Didn't work very well for him. Number 12. Who will set up the final kingdom? Now we're down where the stone comes into the picture. Daniel 2.44, what did the prophet tell us? And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven not to be confused with Nebuchadnezzar's myriad of other gods. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That's the kingdom that will last forever. Jesus is coming soon. That's the next kingdom. Number 13. What does the stone do to the other world kingdoms? It says, 
Daniel 2, verse 34 and 35, a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and did what? Broke them in pieces. So this whole thing that represented counterfeit worship, you know the big issue in the Bible is worship? And you know, by the way, you know the commandment doesn't say don't make an image or I'm in trouble right now, huh? How many of you when you came in you saw the big inflatable? How many of you saw that and came in because you thought this was a Halloween party tonight? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I looked out my window at the hotel and I saw all these people taking pictures out there with the uh, our Babylonian model. Bible doesn't say just don't make an image. If you've got a photograph you're in trouble. It says don't make it and bow down to it. Right? Well they worshiped idols. Now the only stone that is cut without man's hands was the Ten Commandments. God hewed those first tables of stone and handed them to Moses. Later Moses broke them and God got another set. So it says, broke it to pieces. And what happened to the stone? It says that stone that smote the image became a great mountain. The kingdom of God is often referred to as the mountain of the Lord will be glorious. And it filled the whole earth. Babylon is in a plain. God's kingdom is a mountain. Jerusalem was on a mountain. And it filled the whole earth. The Bible says that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters do the sea. It's talking about Christ's kingdom. When blessed are the meek, what will they inherit? The earth. And so this is not talking about something that happened in the past. Now it's talking about we're living in that age of iron and clay down on the toes of this image. The next thing that happens is the coming of Christ. Can you imagine the look on Nebuchadnezzar's face after he saw this? After hearing Daniel's clear interpretation of the dream, what did Nebuchadnezzar say about the Lord? You can read in Daniel chapter 2 verse 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods. He's not just another God. He is the God is what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. And the Lord of kings and a revealer of, there's that word again, secrets. Now later Nebuchadnezzar wanted to worship Daniel and he wanted to give him all these gifts. He actually promoted him and made him well, leader of all the wise men which was probably a smart move. And Daniel told the king the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. Now, just think for a moment friends, if I told you I'd like you to all come and visit me and you've never been to my house. Let's suppose I, I live, you know, 20-30 miles away from you. I say, okay, you get on Main Street, you drive five miles down Main Street, never been to my house before, and I said, you'll see a great billboard sign. It will be purple. It will be advertising a barber shop that gives a 50% discount if you're bald. <laughs> so, I'll say, when you get there, you turn left and you'll see Forever Street. Go down Forever Street five miles. You go, you drive down and sure enough, there's the billboard, purple, 50% discount if you're bald. You see a street, Forever turns left. You turn left. So you go five miles down that street. You're looking at the directions I've written out for you. And you're going to see another landmark. You're going to see a hamburger stand with a big cow on top. It's a yellow cow, but it doesn't have a normal cow tail. It's got a corkscrew tail like a pig. So you drive five miles down the road and you see this place and you see a big yellow cow. Well, that must be a place. And so you turn left there and you go another five miles. You'll see a road that's called uh, Winding Road. See, and it's a windy road. You go five miles down that road. And then I tell you, you're going to get to another well, landmark. Big billboard that um, says, Repent now, the end is near. <laughs> and I say, you turn right there. And you get down five miles and there's the billboard. It's got this sign saying, Repent now, the end is near. And you turn right there and I say, five miles down that road you're going to see the only house out in the field, white picket fence, and the house is yellow. That's my house. Address is 777, whatever you want. I'm not going to tell you my address. Karen told me not to tell you my address. <laughs> now you go on that journey and every landmark is there just like I tell you. Why would you ever doubt that the last thing in the instructions would be there? God has given us a map of history. That's why this book is so popular. is because we can look back on history. We know that Daniel wrote these things before they happened. Everything has happened with these world empires. What does the head of gold represent? 
Babylon came and went. More valuable, didn't last as long as the next one. Medo-Persia is the silver, right? They fell to the Greeks. All of these occupied Israel. Did you know that? Babylon occupied Israel. Persia occupied Israel. The Greeks occupied Israel. And Rome occupied Israel. But then it divided. And after, during the time of Jesus, the kingdom began to go everywhere. Because Jerusalem was destroyed. Christianity became spiritual Jews as well. And then you had the Roman Empire. And it spread through the Roman Empire. Paul was killed in Rome. The gospel has then been going around the world. Now the whole world is what this last kingdom is talking about. That stone that is going to come, it, it's called the Rock of Ages. It's Jesus. The next thing that is supposed to happen in this vision is Christ coming. Now these are interesting prophecies, but I have to be honest with you right up front. We don't do these seminars just to be fantastic or sensational and wow people with the power of prophecy. All prophecy is redemptive. And if you know these things but you don't know Jesus, won't save you. The Bible says even the devils believe and tremble. The reason the Lord gives us these prophecies is so you'll know that God is not surprised by history. There's a plan. And He has a plan for your life. He will not activate and mobilize that plan until you give Him your heart. And that's something you need to do. He wants you to find that peace. He wants you to find that rest. Have you found that rest? Have you found that peace? Are you part of God's kingdom? If He reigns in your hearts now, you don't need to worry about the next phase of this vision. Amen, friends? Amen. I'd like you to pray about that and think. As John comes out, he's going to sing for us right now. And then we're going to close off our program with prayer. My faith has found a resting place not in a man-made creed I trust the ever-living one that he for me did plead I need no other arguments I need no other plea it is Kelly is beautiful. Appreciate that. Friends, this is just the beginning. There is so much more that you're going to learn that's going to transform your lives. It is amazing to me that people do not uh, find more interest in studying the book and the prophecies that God has given to show us that there is a plan. God has a plan for you. The Bible says that He's everywhere. He's all-powerful. And yet He loves us so much, He wants to have a personal relationship with each one of us. You know, most prophecies understood best looking backwards. Jesus said, when these things come to pass, then you will believe. He wants us to look back and say, wow, God really does know what's going on. And this is just one little prophecy of many we're going to share with you. As we continue to study, we're going to be looking ahead. We hope that you'll plan now on coming. I'm absolutely sincere. I'm saying this from my heart when I tell you of all the things 
that you could be doing in this next few weeks while we're here this is the one that may make an eternal difference in your life as well as improve your life here and now because if what I'm seeing is true nothing is more important if this world is not lasting much longer and Jesus is coming as I believe he is then you tell me being ready for his coming and doing what he wants us to do in the interval what in the world could be more, pop, uh, more important than that so God has a plan for us we believe you're either watching on television or the internet or you're here tonight because of a divine appointment it's a little landmark in your life we hope and that you'll plan on giving God the priority in these next few weeks that we're going to be studying together you'll be getting additional lessons each night we hope that you'll do the lessons if you've not registered yet you can go to Landmarks of Prophecy and register there and our program tomorrow night we're going to be talking about the second coming of Jesus and all the talk, uh, the teachings, some of the prophecies about the nearness of his coming no we're not going to set a day in an hour but we're going to tell you when you can know biblically when that time is near it is not too late for you to invite a friend if you don't have any friends invite an enemy but <laughs> It's, we've just begun. Amen? Amen? I'd like to pray with you as we close. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your presence here tonight, for bringing us safely together to study your word. We ask for you to protect and bless each person. And as we come together as your children to seek first your kingdom, I pray, Lord, that you'll reveal yourself to us. Help the word to come alive, to set angels about this entire event, each person that's watching or attending, and transform us. You promise, Lord that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. If we seek, we will find. Now honor that promise, Lord. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless you. Good night. I'll look forward to visiting with you outside. God bless friends who are watching.